Hello and welcome to this event as part of Manchester Science Festival, produced by the Science and Industry Museum. My name is Chris Keady. I'm Head of Learning at the Museum that explores ideas that change the world. Let's talk about eco-anxiety is going to explore how climate change affects young people and their mental health. And there'll be an opportunity for you to interact and have your say too. The event has been devised and created by the Manchester Science Festival Young People Panel a team of budding Greater Manchester researchers and curators, all aged between 14 to 24, who have been working across the festival to ensure the voices and interests of young people are truly represented. I'd like to thank Ella, Mahala, Molly, Nyan, Phoebe and Tom for their work in curating this event. The event is about to begin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to that wonderful introduction from Chris and good afternoon everybody and welcome into this event titled Let's Talk About Eco Anxiety. My name is Niall Henry and I'm the founder and CEO of a trailblazing social enterprise called The Blair Project, which exists to tap into the climate change activisms of young people by providing them with hands-on experience of working with green technologies through the conversion of petrol go-karts into electric go-karts, which I will say they get to test and race to see which is the fastest and the most energy efficient. Also, I'm a youth board member for the Manchester Climate Change Agency, and I'm delighted to be chairing this event curated by the Man uh, Manchester Science Festival's Young People's Panel. They have been working with the festival producers to create an event like this, which is being led by young people for young people. So this is their idea and their hard work coming to fruition. So enjoy this event. Before we start, guys, I'd just like to say that there will be live subtitles for this event, which you can access by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom right hand side of your screen. So. I think it's time we start the main event, right? Good. So we are often confronted by headlines of extreme weather conditions and the growing concern about the future of our planet. Climate change is an issue that is at the forefront of many young people's minds and its impact on our mental health is only starting now to be talked about, most often described as eco-anxiety. During this event, we're going to be talking about what exactly is eco-anxiety, why should we be even be talking about it, what resources are there for, let's say, for, you, uh, for dealing with it and coping with it, and how should we be talking to young people about this issue. Also, during this event, we're going to hear from each of our fabulous speakers here today about their experiences and thoughts about eco-anxiety, and also, we're going to be following up with a general discussion and some questions from our audience. So what we want from you guys at home is to send in any questions that you have uh, to, to our panelists and also submit any tips that you have for coping and dealing with eco-anxiety. And just to let you know guys that there will be adults watching this event too, who are often the decision makers for young people. So what we're interested in is hearing and for you, the young people, to share your messages to the adults and see how they can help support you uh, if you have eco-anxiety or just want to talk about it. So what we're going to do now, guys, is that we want you, as well as uh, sending the questions, we want to hear any tips that you have as well for eco-anxiety and share any messages um, about climate change and eco-anxiety with the adults as well on this stream. So you can join the conversation by going over to slido.com and entering the event code LTE. I repeat, that's LTE. And as well as sending the questions, the tips and the message, I want you guys to leave your name and where you're from because I'm going to give you guys a shout out. Brilliant. So now before we introduce all of our panelists, I'd like to introduce you to Caroline Hickman who is a lecturer in social work and climate psychology at the University of Bath. Caroline is going to give us a short presentation about what exactly is eco-anxiety. Over to you, Caroline. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that intro. Uh, I thought it was really important for all of us that we just had an understanding first about what this means. And I work as well at the University of Bath with a group called the Climate Psychology Alliance. And what we're interested in doing is bringing a psychological understanding of the climate and biodiversity crisis into the conversation because feelings need to be included too. So I'm going to take us on a very quick five minute journey how we can move from eco-anxiety to eco-aliveness and eco-empathy and eco-connection. Because my bottom line message or top line message for you today is if you're feeling anxiety about the state of the planet in climate and biodiversity, actually that's a really healthy thing to be feeling because the reality is that things are really rather scary. But we can turn that anxiety into a form of action and connection and empathy, which will help us all. And there's a really good quote from Gus Speth, who's a climate scientist, which I think helps us understand this. When he says he used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity, ecosystem collapse and climate change. And in 30 years, good science, we could deal with those problems. But he says he was wrong. Because for him, the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need both a spiritual and a cultural transformation. And scientists don't know how to do that. Why that's important is to understand that we can't just find technological fixes. We've also got to have emotional fixes. We've got to have relationship fixes. They've got to be cultural. And they've got to deal with the fact that climate change is a problem of global injustice. It's not just about climate events. And we can look at the scale of what we're talking about here when we look at the scale of COVID, which has been a really frightening thing affecting not just the UK, but globally. And of course, this is causing recession. And again, this causes anxiety. So we're not minimizing this, but we need to put this in the context of the bigger, more global problems of climate change and biodiversity collapse, because COVID, of course, is actually part of biodiversity collapse. So we mustn't be thinking about these things as things that we can get over and then get back to normal without thinking about the bigger picture, because this is all happening in the bigger picture. So there's the big global picture, but we also have to think about our responses emotionally to climate change as not just things that we're dealing with consciously, but there are also things happening under the surface for us emotionally. And sometimes these feelings bubble up. So I just want to remind us that we're not completely conscious creatures. You know, we think we're in control of our feelings all the time, or at least we like to think that we are. And then things come up out of nowhere and out of our awareness. And we think, well, where's that come from? Um, so it's come from the unconscious, right? So this is really important to remember as well when we're thinking about how we define eco-anxiety, because we are living with this uncertainty about whether we're going to take enough action quickly enough to reduce the spread of the more extreme impacts that are already happening globally. And if we look at what was happening in Texas last week, we'll see immediately what's happening. So anxiety is a really healthy response emotionally to what we're facing. We measure mental health by saying, are we responding to external reality? And if we are, then that's a mentally healthy emotional response. So feeling eco-anxiety is not a sign of mental health problems. It's actually a sign of mental health. Now, we don't want people to get stuck with those painful feelings. We need to be able to talk about those feelings and turn them into something more positive so that we can take action. But otherwise, we're going to try and fight against them or we're going to run away from them or we'll get stuck emotionally. And those are not comfortable feelings. The other thing to remember is that it's not just anxiety. We start with a feeling of anxiety when we look at the threat out there in the world. and We think this is really scary. Anxiety is a really healthy response to how to that, but it's not just anxiety. That's the gateway emotion. And it also leads to other feelings like grief and nostalgia. So nostalgia is a sense of grief in relation to my environment that I love. We can feel hope and hopelessness, anger, blame, frustration, guilt. We can have fantasies of rescue. We can have apocalyptic fantasies. It's all hopeless. We can try and avoid it. We can think, why bother with nihilism? Or we can feel despair. 
What I really want to say to you is it's okay to feel all of these feelings, but preferably not all on the same day or all at the same time. But we often go through a journey through these feelings and it's really healthy to be able to journey from the anxiety and the fear and feeling threatened towards the guilt and depression because depression is something that a lot of us we don't enjoy feeling it. It's not a nice feeling, but it's actually really important in helping us feel sorry for what we've done and think about what we need to do next. So despair can be really valuable here. Again, we just don't want to get stuck in it because that what that does is it helps us move to this emotional acceptance and moving on. And the good news is if you look at the far right hand side, the moving on, you're functioning at a higher emotional psychological level than when you went in. So if you're going to ask the question, why do this? Why do I have to go through these difficult feelings? That's why you're building emotional resilience. This is building emotional intelligence. We're going to talk more about that later on. It's also really crucial for young people in particular, but for old people too, it's to link that eco-anxiety with our empathy and our care for the planet and for the animals and other species and the trees and the environment that don't have a voice. They can't speak out on behalf of themselves, but we can speak for them and we can care about them. And it's often that that really activates young people, this powerful sense of empathy of what's happening to the polar bears, what's happening to the koala bears. And I want us to today to be partly celebrating that empathy and that care from young people because that's a really empowering thing to do and I think we should be proud of young people taking a stand and speaking out about that. So very quickly, what else can we do psychologically? Well, I, my message is going to be keep the feelings in the frame. Always ask about feelings first. And I talk about internal and external activism. We're going to hear from the other panelists about the brilliant external activism that young people are doing. Absolutely brilliant. But we've also got to do internal activism. We also have to give time to these feelings. And we could remember to feel, think, breathe. Breathing's going to be really helpful to help manage those uncomfortable feelings. Then we can understand and then we can act. So fundamentally, what that then gives us is this opportunity to transform eco-anxiety into eco-understanding, eco-empathy, eco-compassion, eco-courage, eco-powerfulness, eco-connection, eco-psychology, eco-belonging, eco-meaning, eco-care and eco-aliveness. So I do not want us to think about eco-anxiety as something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of or scared of. I want us to think about this, that it's something that we should be proud to be feeling, but we don't want to be feeling it alone. So back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline, for that presentation. I've definitely learned a lot, lot more about what eco-anxiety is, and I hope you, the viewers at home, have, have a better understanding of what it is now. But I'd like to introduce the other panelists as well. So we've got Dr. Maya Rose Craig, who is an 18-year-old prominent British Bangladeshi birder, which I'm hoping she's going to tell us a bit more about what that is. Uh, so I'm really interested in that. Uh, she's a con conversation conservationist and an environmentalist. And we have Martin Dugan, who is a BBC Children's Newsround presenter. Uh, Martin is also a wheelchair user and has cerebral palsy. So panelists and i'll come to uh, caroline first uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and some of the work that you are doing yes absolutely thank you so um as a psychotherapist i work with a lot of young people and children but also adults who are struggling with feelings of eco-anxiety worrying about the planet and how we're going to cope with that uh, at the university, I teach in social work, but also climate psychology. The University of Bath is now trying to extend teaching about climate change across the curriculum to all students. So we're teaching chemical engineering students about climate psychology. Um, and also in my research, I'm talking with young people about how they feel about the climate emergency and publishing that and trying to get their voices heard more, particularly young people from countries like Nigeria, Bangladesh um, and the Maldives, because they've got a lot to say, but it's sometimes their voices are dismissed. I think it can be very hard for adults to listen to the anger and frustration that young people are feeling and can often try to dismiss that. So I really want to try and get in the way of that because young people are seeing this problem in terms of their future and 
their children's future in a very different way. So I try to help translate sometimes what they're saying and why we should be listening to it today. Brilliant, Thank you. brilliant. So I'd like to hear from uh, Maya Rose and tell everybody, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, more about your work. Of course, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Maya Rose, I'm 18 and um, I do lots of different things, but they're all centered around um, environmentalism and engagement, basically. So one of the big things I do is a project where I work really, well, I have various projects working with children from ethnic minority backgrounds, especially from urban or deprived areas in the UK, and work to take them out into the countryside and give them those opportunities to engage with nature and the environment, which I think is incredibly important for um, young people's mental health. I also do a lot to do with the climate change movement. So I've been heavily involved in youth strikes in the past, and I am also very regularly having conversations on, I suppose, a broader global level to do with, um, you know, the environment and climate change. So I feel like I have a relatively uh, unique perspective on eco-anxiety in that I am like a young person. I know lots of young people who are dealing with it at the moment. Fabulous. And Martin, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Of course. Hello, everyone. So my name is Martin and I'm one of the presenters slash journalists on Newsround on CBBC. For those of you who don't know what that show is, it's basically a news, a daily live news programme uh, for young people aged between 7 and 14 years old. And, you know, we cover a whole range of different stories each day, just like a news network like BBC News would. We cover COVID, we cover anything to do with eco, anything that's out there, news rounds will we'll have a go at it. But I suppose more recently, like a lot of us, a lot of the attention has been focused on either COVID or what's been happening with the environment and the planet in so many different ways. And luckily, uh, last year, I was sent to Fiji to do a special report for news rounds uh, because it was about the, the rising sea levels in the South Pacific. So it was a really good insight into, into sort of how... Uh, the actions that we are doing on this side of the planet impacts people living on that side of the planet right now. Uh, so that was that was really good. But yeah, that's that's something that I've done more towards the sort of environmental side, and we've given young people a voice. Uh, you know, since the the mar the movements have been happening, so it feels like yeah, we we cover stories at news around a broad range, but it feels like we're focusing a lot more, quite rightfully so on what's happening with the environment because I feel like our audience starts right at the very heart of what they, you care about. Absolutely, rightly so. I think this is now the probably a good opportunity to move into the open discussion part uh, of the session. So guys, don't forget, you can send in your questions on Slido. Any tips, uh, send any questions uh, to our panelists on Slido using the code LTE, which is displayed on the screen. Also, share any tips that you have, like I said, if you've ever for dealing or coping with eco anxiety, and any messages that you'd like to send to adults watching this stream about climate change or eco anxiety. So, my first question is going to go out to all of our panelists. And the question is why do you think we should be talking about eco anxiety? I think I will start, I'll point that question towards Caroline first, as the expert. I think we may have a bit of a, a, a froze on Caroline's end, so if I direct the question towards Martin. Sure, no problem. Uh, I think that it's important because it's, I think that a lot of people don't really see it as a thing actually but uh news round last year we actually did a study uh, about eco anxiety itself focused on eco anxiety just basically asking 2000 kids between the ages of 17 to 14 what they thought eco anxiety was they basically told us what eco anxiety is and they, they basically spoke and told us about what that means to them whether it's not sleeping at night whether it's really worrying about the environment day in day out what their thoughts were uh, and then we actually got some stats that told us, for example, that uh, four out of five kids actually lose sleep when it comes to eco-anxiety every night out of those 2,000 kids that we spoke to. So I think it's really important because even though it's not maybe clinically or 
uh, you know, professionally diagnosed as a thing yet. Uh, I think that the audience that we speak to, the audience that I talk to every single day, would certainly argue that case. And I think that anxiety is such a strong word, but it is broad. And a lot of people would argue of, uh, you know, anxiety should it be used in this sort of way, like equal when it comes to this subject. But I think because of the stats that we've seen from kids that we've spoken to, it's important because they are telling us the people that care about it the most, the people that it impacts maybe in the future, they are telling us that it definitely is a thing and we all need to kind of pay attention. And Martin, what are some of those age, what's some of the age ranges of those young people that you've been speaking to that have gone yeah. through eco exactly? Yeah, so the age range, I mean, the age range that we've we've spoken to specifically was seven to 14 year olds. However, there were a few younger than that, you know, on the low end of that demographic, and there were a few on the high end. And the thing that's interesting from, from speaking to such a, a broad range of, of people from that age group, um, the the opinions and the thoughts don't change. So, you know, as you become, when you're a six-year-old, you don't normally think the same as a 14-year-old. Do you know what I mean? In a lot of ways, a lot of ways you've kind of progressed into thinking something different and you form opinions for yourself. But, you know, the amazing thing about it is, is these kids, I've got a 10-year-old daughter and she is so switched on to what's happening in the environment. And I think the amazing thing when I've spoke to teachers, parents, experts, adults of any way, I think the, the thing that's amazing about speaking to kids is they're telling the older people now how it needs to be done and they're all in agreement basically the six-year-old is in the same boat as the 14-year-old and they're all coming together and telling the adults what needs to be done now and that's what's um, that's what's really really great about this particular subject is that it seems like everyone is in the same boat yeah and caroline uh Question to you, uh, why should we be talking about eco-anxiety? Well, we've really got to be talking about it because it is affecting all of us and it's affecting all of us globally. It affects you no matter what age you are or what cultural background you've got. It affects all of us no matter how much money you've got or haven't got. So if we don't start to have this global conversation soon in the way that we're trying to develop with COVID, we're going to be in big trouble because we need a global response to this. We also need to not blame young people and children for raising this. Frequently, we hear stories like Greta Thunberg and other youth climate strikers of frightening children and causing anxiety. They're not causing anxiety. What they're doing is raising awareness of the issue. And as you become aware of the issue, then you'll get in connection with those feelings. And as you feel the anxiety, then you'll be know it. They're not causing the anxiety. They're raising the anxiety that's under the surface all along. And the numbers are increasing. So it's really important that we increasingly have these conversations. I know that COVID complicates that. But last year, a YouGov poll in 2020 found 70% of 18 to 24 year olds were more worried than a year ago. A poll that came out this morning in an epigram at the University of Bristol found 70% of students they surveyed are more worried this year than last year. So it is increasing. I was also really delighted to hear, not pleased as in I want children to suffer, of course I don't, but I was really pleased to hear that we were talking with younger children about this as well, because I've been talking with children as young as six and seven. And I absolutely agree with the comment you made. The younger children actually reflect the feelings of the teenagers, who in turn reflect the feelings of the adults. I spent a bit of time last year talking with a group of climate scientists, all older white men that you might think were very powerful. And actually, they felt the same as the children. They were anxious. They felt they weren't being listened to. The other thing I'm going to say before I shut up is it's not just the anxiety that we feel in relation to the environment and climate breakdown. What really makes this anxiety worse, so the real definition of eco-anxiety that I want to put out there this afternoon, is it's the fears about the environmental breakdown plus the failure of governments to act. So at the same time as declaring a climate emergency, doing nothing, still approving another runway at Heathrow, 
There's no sense in those actions whatsoever. And it's that that creates the really painful anxiety in people. If we were all taking action on it now, collectively, it would reduce our anxiety. Brilliant, brilliant. And Maya Rose, as a young person, how, why, why do you think we should be talking about eco-anxiety? Um, honestly, I think it's because it's something that has completely swamped so many young people's lives. Like, I think what a lot of people forget is that climate change has existed m much, much longer than most of us have. It's been a thing for our entire lives. We've been, you know, flooded with terrible news our entire lives about the state of the planet. And that's something that could put anyone in a state of distress. And I mean, I think, um, going back to Greta Thunberg just because it's such a good example of sort of a, an expression of young people's frustrations I think people felt like she was sort of stirring up a movement from nothing but in reality I think there were so many young people that was really struggling with the state of our planet the state of our environment that suddenly like when before they hadn't really had a voice hadn't had a way to express that was suddenly given away um, even if that meant you know skipping school going out into the streets because it was something and that was better than nothing um, and I think, um, like you guys were saying, I think people really underestimate the way that it's impacting young people. Um, like I know someone who was maybe 10 or 11, a girl who literally just burst out, burst into tears, had a complete breakdown and her mum just couldn't understand. And she said it was because of climate change, because she was just so upset about it. Um, it's really negatively affecting our young people's mental health. Um, and, you know, in an older age group, I think obviously our teenagers are massively vulnerable to mental illness and anxiety and depression and things like that. And when they're also dealing with eco-anxiety, it means that quite often it ends up in a really distressing cocktail of illness, basically, where they eventually burn out. Um, but the, I suppose, stress and desperation of the movement just never really leaves them. It's, it's a real mess at the moment. And I think it's something that we really need to start having conversations about more regularly, like this one. Absolutely. And I suppose my, my next question would be to Caroline is, how many young people in the UK have eco-anxiety? And is it just young people that have eco-anxiety? <sighs> Yeah, we don't know is the simple answer. We don't know because, as you said earlier, it's not a diagnosable mental health problem. So it's not um, recognised as a mental illness. Now, we don't want it recognised as a mental illness because that would label and pathologise these feelings as being located in the individual, i.e. we'd be saying, you've got the problem because you've got eco-anxiety. We don't want that. It's a social psychological problem and it's a part of the community and the need to act is actually how we reduce the anxiety in young people. So we don't know the numbers. All I can say is that we are, uh, I think what Maya Rose was saying was brilliant, uh, sad and painful, but brilliant the way she put it, that increasing numbers of young people are feeling this, but they don't necessarily know how to communicate about it. And adults don't always fully understand. So what's happening is the feelings are developing under the surface and then they break out, they burst out, and they could come out over other fears, maybe around the COVID virus, maybe around going to school. So we don't know the exact numbers, but we know it's massively increasing. The Climate Psychology Alliance is getting more and more and more people contacting us, asking for help. The Royal College of Psychiatrists recently put some advice on its website for parents, how to talk to young people about eco-anxiety. And they've been very clear that it's not a mental illness but it is causing psychological suffering. So we need to not label it as an illness, but we do need to respond to how painful and upsetting it is. But the main way we can do that collectively is to try and empathize and put ourselves in the shoes of people who are worrying, whether they're children or teenagers or adults. Of course, a lot of adults feel this. I feel terrible when I connect with how I feel about the state of the world and the future particularly the future that young people will be having. I go through all those feelings of anxiety and depression, and despair and anger, but I've maybe got more used to managing those feelings and turning those feelings into a form of action. So I guess I'm lucky in that sense. 
and the work I do with other young people and with youth activists is somewhere for me to put those feelings of frustration and anger and despair and anxiety. So I think it's about having something to do with those feelings and collectively coming together with other people so you don't feel ashamed of feeling that way. It's healthy to feel that way. And Caroline, this psychological fear that you mentioned that young people developed, wh where does that come from, would you say? Um, it comes from looking at the reality of the state of the world, looking at the scientific data, looking at the predictions, but also looking at the reality of what's happening around the world. Young people are very switched on, connected, and have a strong global empathy and understanding. And they're not necessarily thinking in short-term ways about their own individual future, but they're thinking about their children's future. And they're also thinking empathically about how this affects children and young people elsewhere in the world. So there's a real generosity and connectivity in terms of global understanding. Let, let me give you a quote from uh, a 14-year-old in the Maldives, and it'll show their understanding. This 14-year-old said to me, climate change is like the Avengers Endgame. Uh, climate change is like Thanos, whose ideology is to kill off half of life in the universe so the other half can thrive. He said, but the trouble is, in the Maldives, we're the half being killed off. In Bangladesh, we're the half being killed off. In the low-lying Pacific nations, they're the half that will be underwater. Another child said to me, you know, climate change is happening to rebalance something that was out of balance in the, in the world. We, people had lost sight of what was important. They'd lost sight of the need to understand our interdependence and our connection with the environment. We need to stop looking at trees purely as an economic value and understand that if we don't have trees, if we don't have bees, then humans won't exist either. And I think young people are very clear sighted about the realities of that. Mm, mm. And my next question is for Martin, just to, and it's just a follow up of uh, what we've just been talking about. And a lot of young people, as well as the reality around them, uh, social media and uh, what they see on TV will play a big part. How do we communicate? Um, how do we honestly but sensitively communicate? Uh, climate change news to young people in the UK or, or around the world? Mm. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. I've always taken the approach, people might think that we kind of soften it or we use ways to soften the blow. Not really. <laughs> I think that the best thing to do is, you know, obviously tell the story in a way that's easily digestible. I'll try and think about an example of that, but don't take anything away from it is the main thing. Like if when it, we were talking about the, you know, the the rising sea levels in the South Pacific, like I'll use that as an example. When we were coming up with ways of, of showing our audience how people their age were being impacted actually today, how, because maybe if we're living in countries like the UK, uh, America, you know, like the Western world, we, it feels sometimes like climate change is a thing or these things are because we're not quite feeling it but going there uh, to to fiji in the south pacific you're speaking to kids who have had to move because um they've had to move to higher lands we have spoke to uh, young activists from there who are doing all they can to make things happen so i suppose just to quickly go back to your question is what we do is is we'll speak to kids who can communicate it better to other kids do you know what i mean because i feel like us as journalists and as adults, sometimes we get a tendency of getting into old habits of, I don't know, maybe ways, it's our problem communicating to them rather than them understanding the story. So the way that we do it is, the way that I do it is don't take anything away from the story. If it's a stark reality, unfortunately, that's what it is and we're going to have to show it. But the best way to get the message across to young people is to let them hear from, from people their own age because that's when they'll switch on and they'll think, oh, Anne Mary Runjuva from Fiji, who's an activist, is already planting mangroves on that beach. What can I do at that age? Do you know what I mean? It's not a, it's not an adult like me, someone that's quite boring, <laughs> like telling them that there's something happening in this part of the world. So that's how I normally try and get the message across. 
Yeah, and, and Maya, as a, as a young person, and you gave the example, I don't know if you've worked with that young person directly, but they had eco-anxiety, and I, I think you said they were about 10 years old. And um, my question is, does eco-anxiety eco influence your act activism in any kind of way? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think this touches on a wider, slightly weird narrative that we've got around young activists, especially in terms of environmentalism. So um, last year I did a, very, a really interesting project where I was interviewing young activists from around the world in terms of their environmental activism. And a really common theme was how young they all were when they started. Some of them were like seven, eight years old when they became environmental activists. And on the surface, that's something that people would go, oh, that's great. They cared about their planet. They wanted to do something. But when you start really thinking about it, start peeling it back, you realise that that's kind of horrifying, that these children have felt so anxious, so terrified about their future, that they felt the need to go out and do something about it because they felt like the adults around them who are supposed to you know support them um weren't doing enough and obviously those are relatively extreme examples but i think we're seeing the same in the uk um because i think it's really easy to say that we're not experiencing things like climate change that is very distant in places like america and the uk but at the end of the day we are experiencing it even if it's in a much more minor way in america we've got things like the wildfires and the state that texas is in at the moment um i live in somerset in the uk and we get ridiculous amounts of flooding where people's homes are swept away. Um, I think children are much more aware of things than we sometimes give them credit for. And I absolutely think that um, eco-anxiety has been key in fueling essentially a whole generation of children to, um, you know, fight so passionately for the few planet. Thank you for that, Maya Rose. And we're going to have to move on uh, to you guys, the audience questions at home. So if you haven't already, head on over to slido.com on any phone or tablet, type in the event code LTE and come and submit your questions, tips or messages uh, for this broadcast and to our panel members. So the first question that we've got here is from Esther. Uh, what are the barriers young people face? How can adults help navigate these challenges? And I'll put that question towards Martin. I think the barriers that young people face that I've seen is just having a voice and having their voices heard. That That is it, bottom line. And I think that that's where it's going to have to change. I mentioned it earlier on where young people have all of a sudden switched roles uh, when it comes to the environment and when it comes to the economy where we have to sit down and listen to them now and the adults have to sort of take note. I think for me, it's really short. That's been the barrier for a long, long time. These politicians and adults and grown-ups think that they have the answer, but nothing's changing. Do you know what I mean? But now, um, hopefully, if we if we take on board what young people are saying, work together sort of thing and, and be brave enough, we can make change happen. I just want to give a little clap to Martin. Uh, that was that was excellent. I definitely agree with that. Uh, the next one is a tip. So from Emma, she says, uh, a way to cope and deal with eco-anxiety is to find a like-minded group of people to talk to, i.e. a campaign group or a local group of people. And uh, a message from Megan is to say, adults should just listen honestly and openly to young people without judgment and try to work with them instead of just ignoring them. Which, is, yeah, I completely agree with you there, uh, Megan. And another question we've got is from Tia. Would you agree that large companies don't take enough responsibility for their actions and push the blame uh, towards the average person? And I'll direct that question towards Caroline. Thank you so much for giving me that question. I was really hoping that you would. Um, <laughs> it's not just companies, it's governments. So it's authorities, it's people in power that we perceive as having the power to act on this. And the reality is that companies and governments do have the power to act on this. So, yeah, they do need to be held to account for that. But we also need to keep in mind the fact that often what gets in the way when young people speak out around this is they are patronised. They're not trusted. It's, it's worse than they're not listened to. They can be criminalized. 
um, and arrested under the Terrorism Act. It's very daunting for young people to take out and speak out in ways when they've not been listened to. When they've asked nicely and quietly and respectfully, they're not listened to. So of course young people are now having to raise their voices more and more and more. And the other thing that gets in the way of that is adults' guilt and grief and shame. Because adults themselves, let's assume that parents, all parents and all adults want children to be happy and have great futures. Let's make that assumption because most of us do. It doesn't feel good to adults to the fact that we know that we're actually giving young people not such a great future. So we have to, adults have to deal with our feelings that are getting in the way of that grief and that shame and that embarrassment. And realize that in order for taking action on that, that will reduce our bad feelings around it. So the companies and the governments need to be held to account. They need to recognize that they need to feel guilty about this and take action. But the rest of us adults out there in the world need to take action in that way too. Brilliant. And I'm going to read a couple of tips. So we've got one from Liz Brown. Doing something active is helpful. There are at least two local litter picking groups on Facebook, Lee Litter Pickers and Wigan Litter Pickers. It's a first step. And we've also got a tip from Phoebe who says, try not to harbour guilt. It's unproductive for your own mind and your own activism. Uh, and then a couple of messages. We've got Daniel from Stockport. Listen to the scientists and younger generations worried about their future. And then we've also got another question, another message from Matt and just simply says, don't take away our future, which I, I completely agree with there. Uh, and then we've got a, another question here from Martin Porter. Spending time in nature has always helped me. However, is the nature that we have left accessible for young people who don't have cars or own or, or their own land? And that's a question our director, Maya Rose. Um, no, they don't. And it's been, well, it's, an, it's been a massive issue in the UK for a really long time, but I think it's something that people have really started to reflect on in the last year during lockdown because um, you know institutions like the NHS are starting to acknowledge that access to nature and green spaces is really important to our mental health and they're sometimes even diagnosing it when people become you know ill or anxious um, but at the same time there's a massive inequality in the UK in terms of access to nature where at the moment essentially you can only access it if you or your parents have enough time and money and energy and resources basically um, especially because a lot of our green spaces in urban areas especially in poorer urban areas have become extremely degraded and so I really hope um, post pandemic that there's going to be a really serious conversation essentially about access to nature in the UK um, especially because obviously the state of our biodiversity in the UK is becoming worse and worse and I you know I truly think that because um, as people we've become so separate from our roots in nature a lot of people especially a lot of young people who've grown up in cities would never think to go out into a green space to help them to deal with the stress or anxiety that they're going with to separate themselves from their day-to-day -day life which is which is one of the reasons I run a project that's all about taking kids away from their day-to-day -day life into the countryside because I think because there are so many mental health issues, especially in our young population in the UK, I think it's going to be something that's increasingly important, basically. And how long have you been doing that, Maya Rose? Um, I've been doing that for nearly six years now, so since I was 13. Um, and it essentially came from the fact that as someone who is half Bangladeshi, as I was getting older, I was becoming really aware just how many kids just had no way to access the outdoors or green spaces. And as someone who was very privileged growing up, who, who lives in the countryside, um, that felt like a terrible thing for children to have to experience. Fantastic project. I just, oh, we've got another question here from Martin Porter. He put, Martin writes, hi, I'm 50 and I've been an environmental campaigner all my adult life. I'd, I'd be interested to hear from young people who found activism a cure for eco-anxiety. Again, I'll probably go to Maya Rose, but also direct that question towards Martin as well. So Maya, uh, quickly, uh, what would you say? Um, I mean, I'm slightly different because I've been doing it like a lot longer than a lot of people my age, which is why I sort of 
understand how difficult it was for a lot of young people before this whole resurgence and you know the whole Greta Thunberg movement basically but I what I think is more interesting which we haven't mentioned tonight is Extinction Rebellion which popped up around the same time and is considered much more extreme and I think um, and a lot of young people have also gotten involved in that and a lot of people with eco-anxiety and I think that that is a much more dramatic expression of how desperate a lot of people were feeling at that point in time where there was nothing to do but to you know glue themselves to buildings chain themselves to walls because they felt like their government the people in charge had absolutely let them down um and yeah we're, we're still seeing that today basically there hasn't really been a resolution to any of that mm. and martin so uh sort of i'm just coming back so what was it martin was wanting to know because i know that he was an activist for most of his life but what was it that he was specifically just, looking for i'm just trying <laughs> to find the question again <laughs> I'm, sorry, uh, I'm sorry it's disappeared on the app so we may have to go to another question um, move on. i'm sorry martin i'm sorry move on. So, apologies <laughs> martin uh so mariana how does someone like me at only 16 change the mind of other students, siblings, and parents without feeling frustration of not being listened to and dismissed? Mine. All right, then, fair enough. I think that you've you've always just got to, like, the kids that I've spoken to who have managed to get their message across or the kids that I've spoken to at a young age who are still fighting to get their message across is just be resilient, really know your stuff, research it i've always said that way i know that that seems pretty obvious that because obviously the young people know exactly what they're talking about but in terms of getting your message across for me the young people that i've spoken to just don't stop they're just relentless like you know stick to your stick to your goals stick to your guns if you believe in something show show the adults show the people that you're trying to give them proof if you've got a voice and of course get it out there but there's so many ways to show whether that's something online, whether it's fact checking, whether it's showing the impacts of something that's happened that you've seen, like see what you believe you've got to, sometimes the voice isn't enough. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you've got to show people in other ways. Uh, so it might take a few avenues. It might take a few different war of words with that, the people that you're trying to communicate your message to, but never stop sort of believing in that thing that you're trying to say and keep driving at home that's what i've always found with the people that i've spoke to that's what's making them keep going and what's making them successful as well fantastic fantastic unfortunately guys we're gonna have to move on because we're, we're almost running out of time and uh, but i have one final question uh directed to each of our speakers here today and that question is how can we show up as activists for both our own mental health and the health of the planet and if we start with Caroline. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we actually have to listen to our frustration. We have to feel it because it's my frustration that fuels my activism, whether that's psychological activism, emotional activism, or activism out in the world. So actually the frustration is important. You keep feeling it and then you get back up and you keep going. It's a kind of radical hope that we need, not naive hope, that everything will be okay. But a radical hope, which is, yep, this is gonna be difficult sometimes. And sometimes I will feel frustrated and upset or despairing. And that's okay, because that's part of the journey. And then you get back up and you go out and you have another go. And I would finish with the, the question to people, why haven't we all got eco-anxiety? Because surely we should have if we cared. You're right, actually. You are very, very much right. Uh, yeah, yeah, same question to, to Martin. How can we show up as activists for both our own mental health and the health of the planet? Yeah, it's, it, I think Caroline kind of put it pretty well, to be honest. It's hard to kind of put it better, but I think it's just about talking and listening, really, and, and really uh, being the thing that I've found that, that makes pe young people anxious when I've spoke to them is there's a lot of debate around it. People have got different views. And I think that's one thing that I've, well, not really different views in the sense that uh, it exists and it doesn't exist, but people just see things differently and people have got different avenues towards the planet and what they care about, you know, whether it's the the trees, whether it's the, whether it's the seas, whether it's the ice caps melting, people have got something 
But I think it's just about sort of taking the time to listen to other people's thoughts because they aren't the same and just trying to kind of give yourself a break. I think when I speak to my 10-year-old daughter, she wakes up and she feels anxious about stuff whenever she watches an Attenborough documentary or something like that. You know, that's very extreme and it should be. And it shows firsthand how animals are being impacted, how the planet's being impacted and how that's happening. But what I always say to her is, is like, take a breath, you know, and, and, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. Whatever small things you can do day to day that make you feel better and help, then that's great. Whether that's making sure that silly things, like whether you're making sure that you're not running the tap for as long when you're brushing your teeth, it's ridiculous. But, you know, and, and switching your lights off consciously, you know, all the time in terms of when you're not in the room and just little little bits that help with the percentage. That's all you can do, basically, as an individual, is give yourself a break, do the little steps that help you mentally so that you feel like you're helping the process along. And what about yourself, Maya Rose? Um, honestly, my biggest tip would be for people to find a community of people who feel the same way, who care as much as they do, whether that's online or in real life, because it can be exhausting and it can, you know, it can tire people out completely to the point where they completely, um, I suppose, disengage from the environmental movement and then, you know, have all the feelings of guilt about that, even though they're looking after themselves. And so I think, you know, the main preventative measure for all of that to look after yourself is to find people who can support you as well as you supporting them, um, which, again, we've seen in lots of these um organizations and movements popping up in the last few years and I'd say the other thing is that I think a lot of people especially with eco-anxiety feel the need to be um you know the perfect environmentalist whatever that even means because you know there's no such thing um and so I honestly just be nice to yourself um because this is an impossible issue unless you are a government or a massive corporation everyone's just trying their best and you you just can't expect perfection from yourself and um yeah basically what i'm saying is look after yourself um it's a really difficult issue um and eco anxiety is a really difficult thing to grapple with so just look after yourself i think that's just perfect be nice and look after look after yourself um <laughs> That's, that's just great uh, and unfortunately guys we're gonna have to kind of wrap up there but we're gonna have to, we're gonna go over to caroline who's gonna give us a short presentation about how you can deal and cope with eco-anxiety thank you um to be honest i think it's been everything i'm about to say has been brilliantly covered to be honest by the speakers so we'll we'll run through this but there's some practical things here and we've talked a lot today about building emotional resilience and the importance of that. Uh, the thing to remember about building emotional resilience is it's not straightforward. That's why there's a picture of a maze here. So you will hit dead ends. You will get lost. You will sometimes be confused about how to navigate this complicated emotional thing. So absolutely, uh, what all the other speakers have said, be compassionate, be kind to yourself, but don't get too scared if sometimes you get lost or confused in this whole process that's actually just part of it so don't panic too much about that and we talked as well today about frustration um, and the really interesting thing about frustration is it's really important in helping us to develop grit and resilience and long-term resilience because we're in this for the long haul and the metaphor that we've got here is three plant pots. And if you plant a seed in a plant pot, plant pot number one, with no grit in the soil, what you get is a flower that grows and it's got no resilience. It's got no capacity to withstand difficulties. But plant pot number two has got grit in the soil and the roots grow around the grit. So every time that root gets frustrated by a piece of grit, it grows around it in growing round it it gets that lovely wonky shape and it's that that gives shape and resilience to the plant that grows so reframe reframe your or your relationship with frustration with obstacles with people who don't understand people won't understand half the time and that's absolutely fine just keep going and grow around them and 
eventually it's like the michael rosen story we're all going on a bear hunt you know they meet all these obstacles on the bear hunt and they have to they can't go under them or over them or around them they have to go through them so all of these obstacles actually help you build the emotional and psychological resilience that you need but what you don't want is boulders in plant part number three and if there's too many people silencing you or not listening to you if you're on your own too much you will really struggle with this, which is what Maya Rose has said very clearly, find community and communities can break up those rocks and boulders. So you want to be growing in an environment where people will listen to you, but they may not always agree with you all the time. That's all right. Just tell yourself, this is a piece of grit. How can I get around this person that is annoyingly not listening to me? Okay. And then there are other communities, and there's just a few examples here that are going to be up on the website. The Climate Psychology Alliance Open Access website, loads of free access to our handbook, to podcasts. Podcasts are a brilliant way of connecting and listening to other people talking about this. So there's loads of podcasts on our website, but there's loads all over the internet. You know more about podcasts than I do, I'm sure. So go listen to them because they're just a way of having those conversations. There's loads of brilliant organizations, Heal Rewilding, find any community, any pack, any clan. Uh, there's climate cafes, the CPA, the Climate Psychology Alliance helps people set up climate cafes. Rosemary Randall had carbon conversations, become an earth protector, sign up to Polly Higgins and Ecocide campaign. There are parent support groups, support groups for schools, any form of activism, whether it's Extinction Rebellion or UKYCC, join an activist group. The Deep Adaptation Forum online has lots of conversations that are useful. All of this is about challenging this anthropocentric worldview, which is humans are the top of the tree. You know, any form of art and theatre and creativity is brilliant. And then there's Joanna Macy groups about connecting with the environment. And if you're personally struggling, then you can use this kind of exercise. Look around you and name five things you see, four things you feel, three things you hear, two things you smell, one thing you taste. It'll help you connect with yourself and not feel overwhelmed by that anxiety. And if you are feeling enormous anxiety or any other feelings like anger or frustration or rage or despair, just remember that's the top of the iceberg and underneath there are lots of other emotions. So just help yourself think, what else am I feeling under the surface? And remember, you have a body, mind, feelings, but you don't have to be your body or your mind or your feelings. So you have them, but you can disidentify with them so they don't overwhelm. And all of this is about moving to wisdom. We want to build this emotionally intelligent, wise community to address this, which means you need to connect with your thoughts and your feelings. You need that balance between the rational and emotional. We also need the balance between the scientific and the psychological if we're going to address this problem. And I would say personally, keep pushing adults to listen, to wake up. And I think this is one of the best quotes on this from Barack Obama. We miss him, don't we? He said, our children in the future would look back at us and ask if we did all we could have done to deal with this problem, or did we avoid dealing, doing what needed to be done? And I think it's a really lovely message to adults out there as well. Because this isn't about shaming adults or blaming adults. It's about calling them to work in partnership with young people and saying, OK, right, you have some responsibility for the fact that this isn't such a great situation we're inheriting. But now let's work together to resolve this. Thank you. No, thank you, Caroline, for those final thoughts. And uh, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of our panellists here today, uh, Martin Dugan, Dr. Maya Rose Craig and Caroline Hickman. And I just want to say a massive thank you to the Manchester Science Festival's Young People's Panel. I'm going to name the names, Molly, Nyan, uh, Phoebe, Ella, Mahala and Tom. So thank you guys for your hard work and working with the festival producers to put on this event. Thank the festival producers as well. And I want to say a big thank you to Chris for the introduction uh, at the beginning. If this afternoon, uh, whether you're a young person or an adult, has inspired you and you'd like to support the Science Museum 
uh, Science Museum's group mission uh, to inspire the next generation. You can also find a link to a donation button um, to make a donation below. Um, the online talks from this year's Science Festival are now available to watch on their website. Search Manchester Science Festival. Thanks again to our panelists and to you at home for joining us. My name's been Niall Henry and have a great rest of the day.